Support for this episode comes from Modern Football Technology. Modern Football Technology provides real-time opponent tendencies and self-scout while eliminating manual data entry into Huddle, DV Sport, and Exos. If you're tired of tools that are time-consuming to learn and perform inconsistently at best, then we recommend Modern Football for a fresh perspective. Schedule a demo today at teammofo.com to see a battle-tested tool that's proven to perform and deliver value. Mention Coach and Coordinator Podcast or use the coupon code CC10 to receive 10% off your first year. And listen to our recent episode featuring Folsom High School Defensive Coordinator Jordan Ersick to learn more about how the 2023 California State Champion uses modern football to dominate their opponents. I think the first thing is just the philosophical approach to it. And I, again, I stole this from Mike McCarthy, is to think players, not plays. You know, I don't think that's like revolutionary, but I think a lot of coaches probably don't. And so I definitely did. And I always used to tell our players, and I would be very kind of explicit with them, is our offensive game plan is to get the best player of the ball as often as possible. And when he's tired, we're going to get the second best player of the ball. And then when he's tired, we're going to get the third best player of the ball. Today on Coaching Coordinator, we start a new series called Accelerate Everything with Dub Maddox, the creator of R4 and the offensive coordinator at Union High School in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So, Dub, it's great to have you here for this series. It's something we're excited about. We hinted towards this a few weeks ago when you joined me on the podcast, but I'm really excited about how this is shaping up. Yeah, excited to kick this thing off, Keith. Well, we've titled this Accelerate Everything. It's something you've built the R4 system around the idea of accelerating thought processes, accelerating game planning, all those kinds of things. And that's the theme for this series as well. So what can we expect from the series? Well, we're going to target experts that are obviously in the game of football, but we're also going to look outside of the game as well. So anybody that has 10,000 hours of time seeing things through that expert lens, uh, we're going to try to extract what those things are and then put them into a coach's framework for you to take to your team. So Dub, tell us a little bit about our first guest today, JT O'Sullivan, and some of the things that we're going to hear in general on this episode. Yeah, JT is a quarterback expert. He played for 12 different NFL teams throughout his professional career. He has a PhD in leadership studies, and he's also um, coached in high school at a high level um, he's got a wealth of knowledge. He runs an online quarterback school and does YouTube videos where he breaks down college quarterbacks and NFL quarterbacks. And every episode I watch is I take away notes and I wanted to get him on the show because he has a really unique lens to look at the game through and some unique experiences that we're going to share on this pod. What you see on tape is a direct reflection of what you teach and how you teach. Video is important, but if you don't teach well, you're not going to like what you see on your video. First Down Playbook has been helping coaches teach better for 13 years. It allows you to present installs, playbooks, and practice cards in half the time with NFL quality. Coaching tools like video pairing, a player app, practice schedules, and wristband sheets have made First Down Playbook a program management system with everything in one place. If you're in a position of leadership with your football program, receive a free one-week look at First Down Playbook. Call them at 512-814-6158 or visit them on their website or social media. Mention Coach and Coordinator Podcast or use the coupon code COACH24 to receive a $100 discount off the normal $700 First Down Playbook team membership price. Links and the phone number are in the show notes. Our guest today is J.T. O'Sullivan. J.T. played professional football as a quarterback for over a decade, 12 different NFL teams, two seasons in NFL Europe, and one year in the CFL. He has a Ph.D. in leadership studies, and he was also the head coach at Patrick Henry High School in San Diego, and he is now killing it as the creator of the quarterback school. J.T., welcome to the show. Dub, I appreciate the invitation, man. Fired up to talk some ball. Yeah, let's get after it, man. J.T., you're the definition of a quarterback and offensive system design expert in my opinion the myriad of touch points you have had at the highest levels of football you really got a unique lens to see things that many of us cannot so 
my first question is during your quarterback career, what coach made the biggest impact on you and what were some of the things they taught you that accelerated your growth? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I would say the one that made the biggest impact was probably my first. My first uh, coordinator was Mike McCarthy. Uh, he's certainly gone through a lot of changes through the years. It's been well over 20 years since that happened. But the thing that I appreciated that Mike did for me was not only did he teach me our system, what we were running at the time in New Orleans, he was the, he was the offensive coordinator, but he also taught it from the almost from the history of the play. So it was, hey, this is how we're running it here. This is how it kind of got started in, quote unquote, the West Coast world, professional ball. And this is how you can understand it in universal football. So maybe you don't have your whole career here. You go somewhere else. You can have a faster transition to learning their system, their language. So that kind of like tiered understanding of football, I had just never thought of before because where I had been when I was in high school, it was, hey, this is our system. When I was at college, it was, this is our system. And it was never, hey, maybe you know you go somewhere else, they're going to do it like this. We, we call it this. Other teams call it that. And so that idea to just bring a different lens to allow you to, to better understand it and have a deeper understanding of the concepts, the intent, was something that I really, really loved and I tried to do as I played, continue to play, and now as I coach and teach and, and just kind of talk ball. I've heard of Mike McCarthy's quarterback school. Did he have this like built when he was with you? If I'm remembering right, I think I remember him talking about this quarterback school and it was a pretty prestigious thing that he put together. Yeah, so we he definitely did. We called it quarterback school. It was the off season program and it was a combination of you know, it's really just kind of a football dream if you love ball and you're and you're certainly if you're playing quarterback. And so it was everything from getting in the classroom, basically picking a concept a day in the off season and kind of deep diving it, watching all the reps. But it's not only watching the reps from the past year, but it's also going back and watching, you know, Montana footage when he was with the Chiefs, Montana footage, young footage when they're with the Niners. And to be able to kind of overlap to understand kind of the, the bones of how it's what it's supposed to look like and then where we're at and kind of understanding the the rhythm of it that's just hard to you can talk a lot about you know playing within the the rhythm and structure of that old school west coast system but when you see the kind of the operational element of it and then you go out directly out into the field and there's a lot of it's basically like a glorified individual day and that day you just keep compounding for weeks and then when you go into the start of that off season program with the team you feel like you've got this huge head start and you've made these huge leaps and bounds and compounded your improvement over the course of the off season. So you talk about quarterback school and, and you've been in a ton of quarterback rooms in the NFL. So my guess is they're not all the same. Can you give us a peek into behind what an elite quarterback room looks like, specifically as a coach uh, and coaches that are listening? How, how should we model a, a quarterback room and meetings? How would, they, how would those meetings reflect of some of the key components in the best ones that you've experienced? Bro, you're just teeing up the good ones today. I like it. Uh, they, they definitely aren't all the same, although there are a lot of carryover, I would say, at the highest level. I think the thing that jumps off the kind of to the top of my tongue is just the idea that it's, it's a unique environment because you got so many dudes that are quote unquote alphas or have been the leader or the, the influence person their entire life. And now you're in a room together and it's a combination of competitive juices competing against each other, but also usually a pretty decent understanding at the highest level about who's the dude and what's the order and you know who's everybody knows who's getting paid and those types of things. So it's a combination of competitive juices, professionalism, pushing each other, helping each other, collaborating, the cooperation element of it. And then from the coach's standpoint, and and I think this is hard to get, or I certainly didn't get it, and I was, you know, when I was a young guy in the league is so much of coaching at that level, and really maybe coaching in general, is about putting your players in a position to be successful and about being able to, that can be everyone from Tom Brady to the freshman team. And so everybody is looking for those advantages. And if you're a coach that can provide those advantages, I remember being in the, the Patriots quarterback room with Josh McDaniel, young Josh McDaniels and Tom Brady, and those guys are just soaking up any sort of advantage they can get, whether it's on the practice field, whether it's on the film. And they're, they're looking for those types of nuggets and information. They want to be coached hard. And there's a, you know, there's a fine line between coaching someone hard 
and you know dropping f bombs in their face, you know, like you would maybe back in the day. Those days are gone. But there is there is still that thing about the best players wanting to be coached hard. I I think the thing when I think about back in the day, the greatest, the best quarterback rooms I was in, it was a collaboration of everything you're doing. But then you and then when you're not the guy, you want that guy to be successful. Like you want that nugget that you saw on the third down film that pops as the clue of the indicator for what maybe their you know nickel defender is tipping or something like that to to resonate and show up on film and that feels like you're part of that win and when you get the whole room like that because you know oftentimes it's not just the two quarterbacks or three quarterbacks and the quarterback coach it's the quarterback coach the assistant quarterback coach the coordinator sometimes the head coach is an offensive guy and so all it's a committee in those quarterback rooms. It's a little bit different than every other room in the building. And so to be adaptive with what that looks like, but also to realize that we're all trying to get the best performance possible on Sunday all the time. And if that's kind of the the key goal coming out of every single meeting, I feel like you just have all this energy, you're getting better, you feel like you're moving in the right direction and it's a fun environment to be part of. So when you're in that room, you've got to learn and you're consumed with a ton of information. Was there anybody or how do you learn how to take notes, how, how to, you know, filter the information, how to organize it, how to, how to build a framework for it. Are you, is everyone kind of left on their own or is there a veteran quarterback in the room or is there a quarterback coach? Does he teach you like, this is how you take notes. This is how you study film. Um, how does that work? Uh, I can only speak anecdotally for me. It was, I got really lucky. My rookie season, I was with a guy named Jake DeLome, who was kind of a veteran ish guy, oh. but guy, a guy who was kind of a grinder and knew how to kind of maximize his career and he really took me under his wing and told me how he learned offense. And I basically hijacked his system. And so that that was kind of what I did to learn it. Now they, you know, they'll give you the book, they'll teach you, you know, you, you kind of understand exactly what the expectations are for the installs, for the scripts, for all those types of things everywhere you go. But for me, I got really fortunate hijacking a guy who had done it before and who had had success learning the system. And he's also a resource in the room. And so th those types of things made my transition easier. I can also say anecdotally, I had kind of a transition from, and I know this is probably going to hurt a lot of coaches feelings, so I'm going to apologize right away. <laughs> but even when I do presentations now, I often say, Hey, you're not going to hurt my feelings if you don't take notes. Okay. I'm not going to tell you how you learn. I'm not mm -hmm. going to tell you what you should do. I'm just going to tell you my experience. I've sat in those quarterback rooms, sat in those quarterback meetings, sat in those installs, and taken binders full of notes, binders full of notes. Maybe I'd go back late in the week and look at some of those things, but oftentimes the things that made the most difference to my performance and our offensive performance in game, in between the lines, were things that resonated. I never thought, well, I was never in the huddle and I went, oh my God, back on page seven, middle of the page I wrote second and long I expect you know that like that sh that just doesn't happen and so I think that there's an efficiency element of studying of preparing of the preparation element of not just kind of brown nosing to your coach like oh look at me bro I'm over here just writing you know like a diary that's not useful to the game to hey everything that I write down I need to have a process to make an impact the performance of what we're trying to do offensively and if you can find your system, my system, you know, evolved as I played and got a little, it, it probably got a little bit more minimalistic as I went along just because I was so focused on what resonated and what I thought I would have to use in game on Sundays or Saturdays or Friday nights when you're calling plays that it allowed me to be a little bit more free, but, but that, you know, you're talking about years of a process. That's very helpful. And that's some great information. I think we as coaches can learn from, from be, you being in that, in that chair. My next question is this. You're one of the very few people on the planet that's, that's played quarterback at the highest level. And so your ability to perform under extreme pressure, it's a non-negotiable being quarterback in the NFL. So based on your experiences of playing, if you were an NFL quarterback coach or an offensive coordinator now, what are some of the things that you would do different from your coaches that they did with you to help a quarterback perform at his best, and especially in terms of handling the pressure of the, of the position? Huh. Uh, well, I, I think that there are a lot more resources available nowadays to guys playing as far as mental health elements of it. But I was pretty fortunate in my regard, you know, I, I, well, fortunate and unfortunate when, when you, you have a fortunate to have a long career, 
but not necessarily play a lot of snaps in the league. And so that idea being that you have to be ready to go and, and, the, and the stress of what that looks like. And I always tell people a little bit, people always love to glorify the backup quarterback position. And there certainly are some amazing elements of it in the league. But I often felt like I died a little bit each Sunday because you're, you can feel your career is, only, is pretty finite. And to not get those opportunities to play, there are only so many opportunities to play and only one quarterback gets to play. And so for me, that was probably the hardest part of it. But the actual pressure part of it, I, I will say this, this is what I, if I had to go back and do it again and talk to myself through my career, my opportunity to play with the 49ers was really because I was fluent in the system that we are running there. It gave me a huge head start in the camp situation where there was a pseudo competition. That being fluent in that system and being comfortable in the system gave me that opportunity. My default was to do what the coaches were asking me to do all the time. So if the read said, throw it here, throw it there, I'm throwing it there, bro, like a robot. Yeah. And if I had to do it over again, I would have taken bits of that, but then also layered over my own game on top of it. So it would have been a little bit more comfortable turning down things that I thought were muddy or blurry that didn't make sense to me and checking it down as opposed to knowing, hey, he said quarters, throw it to the deep end. I'm throwing it to the deep end. He said it's on him if it's a pick. It's a pick. You know, well, eventually <laughs> it's going to be on the quarterback. And so that, that idea being just a little bit more connected to my game as I was playing, but also knowing that, you know, the only reason you're playing is because the coach trusts you to run his system. That's the big part of playing quarterback in this system. And so I had to do that, but I wish I would have been a little bit more flexible with myself to say, hey, it's not there, let's go make a play. Or, hey, it's not there, check it down. As opposed to saying, hey, he told me it's going to be there. I trust him. I'm playing because he trusts me. I'm letting it rip. And so that fine line for me is probably the thing that I wish, you know, gave me the most kind of issues when I was actually under center. We're going to take a quick time out of this episode to make sure that we share some great resources that Coach Dub Maddox has put together. I know my bookshelf is just full of your books. I've always followed all the things that you do, and you do a tremendous job of just putting together detailed resources that can help coaches accelerate everything within what they do. So tell us a little bit about some of the things you've put together. Yeah, our four teeth is an operating system that accelerates coach and player decision making under pressure. So we built frameworks that other experts and other domains have used and put them in a football process that allows you and your staff to get on the same page and accelerate your ability to learn how to watch film, learn how to game plan faster, learn how to play call faster. And with the common language and the non-negotiables that we identify, it really unifies everyone on your staff and your team to see the game through the same lens. And that's really the hardest thing that we have to do as coaches and coordinators is to unite everybody to see that game through that expert lens. R4 is your answer. You can check it out at r4footballsystem.com. As coaches, we know that some of the biggest hurdles to our team's success can come from off the field. Your team needs support to tackle the endless list of expenses, uniforms, training equipment, travel, and more. But raising that money can feel like a full-time job. Thankfully, there's Vertical Raise. Vertical Raise is the premier online fundraising platform using innovative technology to create the easiest and most efficient system available. Raise more money in less time with a local fundraising coach who works with your team every step of the way to customize the ideal fundraiser. With options for online donations, digital discount cards, premium product sales, and even spirit shops, Vertical Raise has top-of-the-line solutions for every fundraising style. To find out more, visit verticalraise.com and we'll get you connected with an exclusive offer on your first fundraiser. So let's talk about coaching in high school. You're a head coach for three seasons. You went from six and six your first year, three and one in COVID year, and 10 and three and four and league play in your last year. How did you bridge the gap with all the knowledge you've gained through the years and filter it down to your staff and your players to build an offensive system that had a lot of success? Uh, man, look at you with the stats, bro. I didn't even know the records. Uh, okay. felt like Internet's you made it seem like it was really quick. It felt really long three years. Uh, no, <laughs> the, uh, it was, I, I'm just a weird guy where like, I was always thinking when I was playing, even when I was in college that I was going to coach and I just kept playing. Like if I wouldn't have played in the NFL, I probably would be coaching somewhere, you know, as, as a profession. That's just how I felt like I was 
best at. And so when I was playing, in the back of my mind, I was always like, hey, man, we could do this so much better if we did it like this. You know, and I might not always share that information because you don't want to be that guy in the meetings all the time. But in my head, I'm thinking that. And, and so, you know, over the course of years, you get this idea about what you want to do, how you want to do it. And so it was always fine tuning it. And then actually getting into taking the job, installing the systems, finding what fits for us. It was a really uh, a lot of internal struggle with just being able to say, hey, this is how I would want the system if I was playing quarterback, but I'm not playing quarterback. So I've got to have the system adaptive enough to be able to realize, hey, we don't have you know four good wide receivers, five good wide receivers. We're not going to be in 10 personnel. I want to be in 10 personnel. I'd be in zero personnel you know, if I was playing quarterback, but we have really good tight ends. Well, guess what? We're going to be in 13 and 12 and 22 and, you know, and being intentionally flexible with the system was something that I thought was a priority for me as a play caller, just because I wanted to be able to do that. And I felt like that was maybe a limitation of what they were being asked to do beforehand. And so just kind of finding the strengths of what our players were after that first year allowed us to have a probably faster success than everyone else than than maybe people expected. But the the thing about coaching, I would say this, I underestimated the importance and the difficulty of onboarding a staff at the high school level. And just the idea being that it really isn't a static thing. I was really fortunate my high school experience, my college experience, I had the same coaches, you know, for 4 years, 5 years in college. And so there was no real turnover it was a consistency well at the high school area where I'm at where I was coaching we were turning people over every year the lower levels were turning over every year and so to reteach the system as it continues to evolve in real time with what the expectations are that was a real struggle that I just didn't build into the expectations for the role and so that part of it kind of caught up with me a little bit but I it was just a combination of fine-tuning things with the idea being that you know, the, the pillars of what I wanted to do offensively that I love to do were there as kind of the bones of what the system was. That's very helpful. I want to talk quarterback school now, your quarterback school. One of my favorite things to do is watch your breakdown of the college quarterbacks. And in your study of the college game, you're watching a ton of film. What are a few of the schools that you may recommend that, that we study as coaches who does a, a good job of schematic design? Do you find places the quarterback in the best situations to shine? I mean, this one's always tough, right? Because, like, yeah. is it is it the quarterbacks? Is it the system? Is it the mm-hmm. scheme? Is it the resources? You know, the guys that I probably enjoy watching the most are guys that I wouldn't say, hey, try to mold your offense like what USC does or what Ohio State does. You know, that it's, it's easy to say, yeah, go out there and just – recruit the best dudes in the country. And if they come to your high school, you'll be really good. It's just, I love the creativity of some of these systems. And so when I say creativity, I'm talking about not only the consistent element to put your quarterback in a good spot to be successful, but when you scheme somebody open, you know, or when, when someone pops or when you see a play that you've never seen before, or that layer off of some play that everybody runs, you know, everybody runs the same stuff for the most part. You know, I think some people are better at doing certain things than others, but it's the, it's the consistency of layering stuff that I really like. And so I find myself gravitated towards watching Lincoln Riley. You know, I'm a guy who I like gap runs. I like athletic, creative quarterbacks. Yeah. Everybody, you know, who doesn't like that from their quarterback position. And so finding stuff like that, I think, but that stuff for me is, I was always hesitant to say like, Hey, you know, I saw this USC do this, or I saw Oklahoma do this. We're going to put it in. I bet I did that five times as a high school coach. It only worked once, you know, (laughs) and I take a lot of pride in that one time at working, but it was a lot of wasted energy. And so it's, it's one of those things that, you know, it's more for enjoyment and understanding and learning the ball. And I think that there is significant value in seeing where the kind of tip of the spear is schematically and finding what that looks like at different places and where that is, you know, is fun for me, but you know, I can watch what Coastal Carolina has been doing for the last couple of years and realize that's really cool. We're not going to do that. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know, like we're just not going to do that. And so it was, it's fun for me to be able to find the things that, that, that worked for us and be able to say like, Hey, if we're running a lot of duo, who's running duo, like we run duo. If we're running a lot of pin and pull, who's running pin and pull. Like I personally love what UCLA does in their run game. 
Like, I love it. Well, but, but I'm also, you can already hear my kind of regional bias, right? Like, I'm a Southern California guy. I, you know, like, the, you know, there are not a whole lot of people will say, hey, what college football do you love? We love Southern California. Like, that's not. But for me, schematically, like, those are two of my favorite guys. And, then, and they haven't always been there. They're just there right now. But those are two instances where what UCLA does in their run game is what we tried to do at the high school level with our run game as far as being multiple, as far as putting a lot of stress on a defense with combinations, double teams, vertically, some play action, some RPOs. So it was easy for me to say, hey, we can find this and kind of overlay it into our system. Let's talk about the art of play calling. You've been around a lot of, of offensive coordinators. You, you look at a lot of film. What are some traits that make a good – and you've called plays yourself. What are some traits that make a good play caller? Like when you're watching a game, how, how do you know this guy's doing a really good job? What, is there anything that stands out specifically? I mean, yeah, the, so there are a few things for me. I think the first thing is just the philosophical approach to it. And, I, again, I stole this from Mike McCarthy, is to think players, not plays. You know, I don't think that's, like, revolutionary. But I think a lot of coaches probably don't. And so I definitely did. And I always used to tell our players, and I would be very kind of explicit with them, is our offensive game plan is to get the best player of the ball as often as possible. And when he's tired, we're going to get the second best player of the ball. And then when he's tired, we're going to get the third best player of the ball. And so it was like, it was not, it's not recess. It's not rec soccer. Not everybody touches the ball. If you touch the ball, you're pretty good in our program. And so it's an honor to touch the ball. And so that part of it just kind of like, takes a lot of weight off your shoulders I feel like as a play caller like what should we call well, let's call the play that gives the bell to the best player now maybe your best player is the quarterback and that can be a mean a whole dump, bunch of different things but for me that was how I always went about it so on my call sheets I would always have yeah everybody's got the same kind of breakdown whatever but I would always have player sections like you know like he hasn't touched the ball in a series you know he's our best player get, get him in there you know, like I'm, I'm calling this play. This is a play to get him the ball. Those types of things that are little nuggets that are easy, specifically at lower levels. I think at higher levels of ball and even and at the high school level, my favorite play callers layer their plans so you can see things build. Now, obviously, you're not going to go out there and, you know, have three, three, cloud, three yards on a cloud of dust your first series. But you, you want things to build as they go, not, and, and the setup element of it to me and things that build. And then when you start seeing it, and really the only people that know this are the other coaches, when you start building it weeks on weeks on weeks, and then say you're in an area for years, and you know, hey, last year I got this cat with this. This year we're going to build off this. Those little nuggets or like, hey, this guy got me in seven on seven with this bullshit, you know, scissors concept switch thing. And like, I'm going to come back and get him off that. You know, like that happens in high school. Co- like right. for sure that happens. And so I know I'm guilty of that. Like, oh, this guy doesn't know how to adjust, adjust to bunch quads. Well, guess what? I'm not showing bunch quads until we see him in week 10. You know, like sitting on stuff like that, that's my favorite stuff. But like nobody knows that except like your buddy on the staff. You know, like those are like little things that are fun for me and I enjoy and I think are the best of the best. And that those are the nuggets that when you're in the industry, you realize, hey, who's really getting it done across your area, who you really have to prepare for, who does it, who throws you change ups, who does stuff like that. So those are the things that I look for. And then it's just for me, I always enjoy just the best play callers make it fun. Like if your players are like excited to see your sheet, your what we're calling this week, what the what we're kind of where we're going to score with. My college head coach was our play caller. He was a super aggressive guy, great coach. He used to walk in on Mondays in college, throw the game plan on the sheet and say, "Hey, this is worth 35, the rest is up to you." And so it was like it was it was fine. Like we knew we were going to score a lot of points that we were we were really good, but like it's that kind of vibe, that kind of fun thing is is what I enjoy the most. Yeah, I think it's the funnest part of the game. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. That's some really good stuff. Um, I love the fact that you don't hold back on your quarterback school breakdowns. I want to talk pass protection, specifically in the NFL. What What are some common schematic issues that you see in some teams that struggle with protecting the quarterback uh, that kind of make you cringe after playing the position? Oh, man, there are stuff. This is a deep, deep well here. Uh <laughs> There are a lot. I, th- I think my biggest pet peeve, and this happened with multiple systems, and it just doesn't make sense to me, and maybe it's better now, but in five-person protection, uh, having the line slide to where your first read is, so having your hot on the opposite side of where your eyes will be, it just never made sense to me. I was around quarterbacks that thought that they could 
go hot off both sides. They were really good players. I still don't think they did it. Like they, I, I thought they were always living on the edge. And so for me, I, I just like my thing about pass protection is being sound and giving the quarterback answers and tools. And now some quarterbacks can carry a big toolkit. Some quarterbacks need the center to make the declarations. And that's fine. Like I've been around a lot of some really good quarterbacks that if you put them on a whiteboard or made them make the declarations and the calls for pass protections, we'd be in deep shit and we'd be taking a lot of delay games. But they can play and they can they can play the position from within the pocket as opposed to someone like me who goes, hey, if our first read is on the right, I want to be blocked up to the left. I'll handle the hot to my face. I'll handle the issue to my face. I do not want to get crushed from the backside because I'm living on the edge. And so that wasn't always the case. And so when you're not the guy playing, you you just roll with whatever the starter is most comfortable with or whatever the offensive line coach is teaching. And there were, there were things like that where I would just be like, oh, baby, you know, I better not get in there with this call. <laughs> When you were coaching high school, did you call protection or did you give your quarterback freedom to adjust it? How, how did that work in your offense? No, I'm a control freak. There's no like <laughs> – there was uh, – I was uh, – we did uh, – we called everything from the sideline. We were a big peak tempo team, what I called it. I don't know what people call it really, where they look to the sidelines and I would, uh, I would call the protections. And I, we were pretty good about – I evolved to being a much more full slide play action team just because we were so good at running the ball and I didn't want to take any chances with the pass pro. We just, it, we, where we spent our time, we did not spend it in blitz pickup or, you know, uh, that kind of pass protection world. So we would do a lot of play action, a lot of full slide, a lot of move the launch point, a lot of help our offensive line out as much as possible. Every time I watch quarterback school, I uh, walk away with two things. You make me laugh and, and I learn something. Uh, so I have one more bonus question for you. What, what's one passing concept that you absolutely loathe when you see teams running it. Bro, you know where these are going if you've seen uh, <laughs> There are so many. Give me a couple. <laughs> I mean, the ones that jump out are spacing and Hank, if you know West Coast world. And really, those are pretty, I consider them same-ish. You know, they're just, one would be quick game-ish and one would be kind of intermediate. And what I, when I say this, I think it's, it's, if you understand my reasoning, it makes more sense than me just hating on a shitty concept. It's anything that doesn't give you answers. And so if you catch man coverage or match any type of match versus a route that is static or turnaround, you just don't have a lot of answers playing quarterback. And so I don't like those types of plays. I, you know, and, and I want the quarterback to feel like they've got, they can be successful on any play. Yeah, we might be calling it for this specific coverage or this specific expectation for what we're going to see defensively. But if it's not that, it's not a dumpster fire. There's no, there's no option. You know, and so, you know, those are the ones that uh, that jump out right at the gate. It's really just, I'm trying to think if there are any others that I just straight up loathe. It's more just like I prefer, I'm a guy who thinks in concepts. So I like to have one answer on one side, one answer on the other side. Hopefully they mirror up so that it can be a full field progression. But a lot of that full field progression stuff is seven on seven stuff. Very rarely do you see guys go outside the numbers to outside the numbers. I mean, it, it honestly right. never happens. But it's, it's really hard just to go outside the numbers to back across the opposite hash. And so to those types of things, for me, I just feel like giving your quarterback an opportunity to have answers. And the answers are man, zone, pressure. And then if you know you're going to catch a bracket, you know, depending on where you're at in the world, if you're catching brackets or weird man match, zone match crap, like those things are a little bit more advanced. But just give your guy answers to be successful at the line of scrimmage and playing. Those are some great bullet points, I think, for, for every coach. And you'll see this at the highest level. You'll see them call, you know, Hank. You'll see every team run it. You'll see spacing, and you'll see the quarterback get stuck. And so, again, I think coaches listening, make sure you're examining your your passing concepts and giving your, your quarterback answers like JT said. JT, you got a ton of free material out there on, on the Internet, on the Quarterback School YouTube channel. Um, you have a Patreon. You have multiple courses that are available that anyone can access to accelerate their coaching or playing career. Let us know about them and where we can find them. Yeah, I appreciate that. The, the main page is the, is the YouTube page, the Quarterback School. Uh, the Patreon community is a, is a fun group for me because I really try to – it's a little bit looser. It's a really – I try to create the environment of what it's like in an NFL quarterback room. So it's a little bit more rated R. 
but it's a little bit more uh, authentic and honest to what that experience is. And then the courses are really the deep dives where I kind of go into my favorite topics, everything from RPOs, tempos, how to beat every coverage, pass protection. The pass protection is the one I recommend to the players the most. The best seller is how to beat every coverage. I would be embarrassed if I showed you some of the people that have taken that course. It's pretty hilarious to me, but people really like it and resonate, and it resonates across players, coaches, media members, uh, it's it's pretty funny, and then I have an entire offense that uh, I'm really proud of. That it's a lot, but it's a uh, it's one of those things that I just needed to share. Coaches, listeners, guys, there's there's so much content out there today, and I think the challenge for us is we only have so so little time, and it's very difficult if you have 30 minutes of time, whether it be on a drive to work or or at, at home, of really pinpointing you know, where I'm going to spend it. And I can't say enough about JT's quarterback school. It you know, if you only have one option. Click on YouTube, watch his stuff, buy his stuff. You won't be disappointed. JT, thanks for being on. Keep growing the game. We appreciate everything you do. I appreciate it, Dub, man. I've used your stuff many times. I've used this podcast many times, so I appreciate the opportunity to come on here and share. Dub, that podcast was just full of great information from JT. Great back and forth between you two. When you look back on that episode, what are your big takeaways from it? Well, my first one, Keith, was, you know, JT has been in the quarterback rooms of some of the greatest quarterbacks and coaches in NFL history. And he discovered that, you know, elite players are really looking for fundamental and scheme nuggets to be at their best. So as coaches, we must be able to put our players in situations to be successful. And that requires us to make sure we're constantly looking for ways to help our players grow. The second thing was the most difficult task for any coordinator or head coach is onboarding a staff and reducing staff turnover. So if you're a coach or a coordinator, you need to make sure you have a system in place that allows you to accelerate learning. So if you do have new guys coming in, you can quickly bring them up to your level so there's not that gap within a position or position group. The third thing was really good and I really enjoyed that JP shared was the traits that make a good play caller. Think players, not plays. And I know that's a common thing that we hear, but it's every year there'll be that one game I'll look back and why didn't number seven touch the ball more? Why didn't number six? His game plan is to get the best part of the ball. Then when he gets tired, the next player. And then when he gets tired, the next player. And I think that's something that we constantly need in front of us as play callers. Another thing that the best play callers do is they layer their game plans and build as they go through the season. And the last thing that great play callers do that from his experience is they make it fun. Players can't wait to see that game plan sheet or play call sheet. And I think those are three good nuggets that, you know, obviously have some common sense to them. But again, I think it's good for us to keep in front of us every year. Well, excellent job kicking off this series. A great one to lead with. And I'm definitely looking forward to more as we go through the next several weeks. Thanks, Keith. Be sure to go to coachingcoordinator.com for enhanced show notes with links to related episodes and resources. In addition, we have articles and our winning edge takeaways detailed in text. Also sign up for our free weekly tip sheet, which highlights the best ideas from the previous week, trending episodes, and featured resources. Follow me on Twitter at Coach K Grabowski.